what a pleasure and honor it is to spend some time with Sydney McLaughlin and learn more about her story, her faith journey. Sydney, welcome to the Inspire Conference and thanks so much for joining us this year. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Well, most conference attendees will be familiar with your Olympic performance in Tokyo in 2021, but I don't know, but they may not know anything about your backstory. Uh, that leads up to those gold medals in the 400 meter uh, hurdles, as well as the 400 meter relay events. Can you tell us a little bit about where you're from, your family, and how you got involved so early in track? Yeah, um, so I am from Danella, New Jersey, a small town, and I am one of four kids. I'm the third of four. Um, both my parents ran track. Uh, my father ran at Manhattan College, and that's where he met my mom, who was helping assist the team because they didn't have a women's team, but she did run in high school. And my parents put us in sports very young, uh, all different kinds of sports and kind of let us choose what we wanted to do. Um, but it honestly didn't take long for me to realize that track was, was the one for me. Um, I ran my first race when I was six years old and I was very nervous to go out there and race, but my father you know, persuaded me. He said, if you go out there, I will give you a chocolate bar. Um, wow. And if you if you know me, you know that candy is a big motivator. <laughs> um, so I ended up going and running and I actually won. And I think from that moment, it became very clear to me just the freedom and, you know, exhilarating feeling I felt while running was something that I love to do. Yeah. What's your favorite chocolate bar? And is there any opportunity for promotion there? I know, right? Well, I probably don't need it, but um, the milk chocolate from Hershey's with like almonds in it. That's like. Oh, there you go. A classic choice. One. Very good. Readily available in all markets. Okay. Exactly. Well, uh, uh, tell us about uh, what kind of spiritual influence there was in your home. Do you, did you have believing parents? Was church attendance and the like part of your growing up experience? Absolutely. Yeah. Both my parents are believers. Um, and it, it definitely shaped the way that I was raised. You know, it was something that was instilled in us very young, just our faith and a lot of, I believe, our morals and values and how we were raised were built upon that foundation. Um, you know, going to church every Sunday and youth group events and teen camp and things, you know, it brought perspective to a lot of life. And obviously growing up, I don't think I fully understood just how beneficial those things were uh, that my parents put in place and instilled in us. Uh, but looking back, I'm just super grateful that it was such a big part of how we were raised. Yes. There's something about train up a child in the way they should go. And when mm -hmm. they grow old, they won't depart from it. That uh, We've seen that time and again in people's lives. Your family has been heavily involved with track. Uh, and mm -hmm. all have achieved at a high level. Uh, you're one of, uh, you've achieved at the highest level so far, but they were all high achievers. How was your athletic training balanced with spiritual training or was it, was this a balance that was hard to find in your family? Yeah, I think honestly, they oddly enough go hand in hand, you know, um, just the idea of, I mean, more so now than ever, but I think growing up, the idea of perseverance and working towards a goal and every day becoming better and wanting to learn. I, I truly believe that coincides so much with my walk with God um, and pushing towards, you know, hearing the well done, my good and faithful servant. And, you know, the verse about, you know, first uh, Corinthians 10 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And I think that for me, that is now what motivates me in track. I don't think I was as aware of it growing up, but I do believe that, you know, it, they work so well together and I can truly see God, you know, in my running and in my performances. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously there were some foundational, you know, stones laid in your faith. And like most people, you probably had to make it your own. Uh, mm -hmm. Once you left home and were making some of your own independent decisions and saw how yeah. the world works. Uh, and it seems as if maybe something changed in your relationship with Jesus in the recent years, moving maybe from more of that rules based um, 
uh, family understanding of religion to maybe a grace-based relationship. Can you describe what was going on in your life and faith journey that might have been part of that transition? Absolutely. Yeah, I think for most of my life growing up, a lot of it was you go to church on Sundays. This is what you can do. This is what you can't do. And it was so much more of just rules as opposed to relationship. Um, and it didn't really switch for me until, you know, COVID hit. Um, and I was in the house by myself every day, living alone, uh, no one to talk to besides my dog. And I think, you know, just all of the past experiences and traumas that I had felt years prior, now just sitting in an isolated space, uh, took a hold of me. And I, you know, got very uh, low in my thinking. And the only thing that truly brought me any comfort was watching sermons on YouTube and reading the Bible. And that's not something I had been super consistent in before then, but it helped me through this period. And I really started to grow in my interest in wanting to pursue that relationship as opposed to the rules and regulations. And ever since my whole perspective has just shifted and it's it's been so freeing, not only from just COVID, but now just a shift in how I view life to be able to have perspective uh, moving forward. And I'm, you know, I'm grateful for hitting that low because it's now taken me to a place where not only am I high, but I'm also free. Yeah, uh, a great, uh, another example of hard times uh, in a crucible uh, producing some great fruit and good things that will come out of that. So. Uh, we can uh, endure through those trials and see good things come from them. One of the unique aspects of your story is how early in life your accomplishments to date uh, have been achieved. You were setting national records earlier in your high school career and were a two-time Gatorade female high school athlete of the year and were the youngest athlete ever to make the U.S. Olympic track team since 1980 when you ran in the 2016 Rio Olympics. Given this, it would be easy to see how your identity and value could rest solely on how you performed on the track. Tell us how your understanding of your identity and value has changed over the years. And is this something that you still struggle with? Such a great question. Um, I definitely could say that prior to, I would say maybe a year ago, my identity was track. It was based on performance, and if I performed well, then I would gain the approval of others. Um, I had a platform, so my platform was for the approval of others, and I was constantly looking for validation in all of the wrong places. And as we know, those things will never sustain us. I, I was reading the book of Ecclesiastes, and you just realize how much of this stuff is meaningless, you yes. know? And, yes. you know, like, like Solomon says, it's like chasing the wind. And... Yes. It never fulfilled me, um, and I was constantly looking for more. And that I think that's something that so many people today are just looking for something tan like truly to hold on to that's not going to leave them. And for me, when I found Jesus and I found my true identity, which I think, you know, my identity is found in Him. So first and foremost, that means knowing Him, and in knowing Him, I will know who I am and who I was created to be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's moments for sure where I'm, I, I, my mind and my thoughts may slip back, but just being able to reaffirm what he has already spoken over me constantly just reminds me that, you know, I am secure because he is secure, you know. Awesome. I love that. You know, being involved in a body stewardship ministry, I'm regularly reminded how intertwined our identity can become with our physical bodies. In many ways, our bodies become a manifestation of how we view ourselves. For many viewing this interview today, their honest response to the question, what is your identity, would be, well, it's my job. It's my boyfriend or girlfriend or spouse. It's my income. It's my body. It's my sexual preference. It's my ethnicity. It's my performance. It's even my sin. That's what identifies me. As one who has had to fight imposters to find your true and lasting identity, what advice would you give to those who are, who are in this fight with you? Such a great question. I would say, look, look to Jesus. 
you know, I we I saw the that we're gonna talk about Colossians three. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I truly just go back to that verse. And as a believer, it's just so comforting to know that there are so many different places that people can look for their identity. But to have one place where it's already decided for you and it's mm-hmm. it's truly never to harm you and only to help you and you know, you know that it's never going to change, like that should be the validation and the security that people look for, you know, and Colossians 3 talking about how your life is now hidden in Christ and you have died. So you don't have to worry about, you know, what everybody else thinks and what's going on in the world and all those things, because he has already, you know, you are looking at him. And if you are beholding him, you are not worried about what's, you know, everything that's going on around you and your, your eye is truly focused on what matters. So, you know, in in that battle, I truly would say to anybody who's struggling with that, just to look to Jesus, because he is the answer to that. And in looking at him and in seeking him, you will find who he has called you to be. Yeah, I found in my own life that Jesus is not transactional. I don't mm-hmm. have to do something better for him to love me more. I don't even have to obey him better for him to love me more. <laughs> he's already yeah, he's already decided that, and I'm free as a as a act of gratitude uh, as his child to respond to that rather than to try to earn something from him that he's already given to me. Amen. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, guess that many who are listening to this interview are hearing what you're saying, but in their minds they're thinking, "Well, that's great, Sydney, but here's this beautiful young woman." amazingly talented athlete who is engaged to a great looking football player and who is talking to me about struggles with identity. Um, Well, natural responses like this arise from the assumption that talent and beauty, fame, money, remove problems from our lives and make our lives easy. Is it easy to be Cindy McLaughlin? And where do you have to trust God? Well, that's a, That's an intense one. Um, I don't think money, fame, looks will ever take away anybody's problems. I truly believe they would only add problems. You know, Mm. you hear about how many verses there are in the Bible about how much harder it is for people with all of those things to attain the kingdom of heaven. And, Mm. you know, they can truly be hindrances, even though they may look cool and they may seem attractive to the world. We are not called to be like the world. And for me, I, you know, I've struggled a lot throughout my life of just looking at other people who I thought were in better positions than me and wondering if they have it easy or if that's the life I want for myself and this constant cycle of comparison. But truly, I'm, I'm so content with just my relationship with God that it doesn't matter what I look like. It doesn't matter what I do for a living, how much money I have, because at the end of the day, all of those things will be, they won't, they won't come with me. You know, the only thing that I will have when I stand before God is what I did on this earth to glorify him. And that's what matters, you know? And I I just think we, as a a human race are so caught up in, you know, especially in a fallen world of looking to one another for what we should do when the reality is looking up is, is truly the only thing that's going to help us get to where we need to go. Yes, an audience of one is one way people Absolutely. put that. Yes, performing for an audience of one. Yeah. Well, as a professional athlete with product sponsorships hanging in the balance, that's the world you're living in. It's easy to see how you could become obsessed with your physical body, your training regimen, your current performance level, etc. And yet you have a spiritual life that you're wanting to cultivate as well. Many listening today are trying to balance their lives just like you are, knowing that their jobs, their families, their health, their relationships with Christ are all priorities crying out for their time and attention. Mm -hmm. What have you pursued in your life that might encourage people in finding a balance between what has to be done for most people, work, families, and what needs to be included, maybe healthy habits and spiritual growth? Those are easy to ignore, at least for a while. How do you strike that balance in your life? That's a great question. So for me, I think, you know, I run for a living. So the workout part is, you know, it's part of every day, uh, even if I don't want it to be. But um, I've found 
it very helpful to just incorporate my spiritual life into my whole day. Um, I, you know, the schedules can get very crazy for everybody in different capacities. So for me, you know, it's waking up and just being able to read before I start my day and having something in my mind to think about as I'm doing my daily tasks. And then whatever it is, you know, whether I'm in the car, I'm listening to some sort of worship music. If I'm on the track, I'm praying for reps and just being able to keep my eyes fixed on the things that matter while I'm doing what it is that I do, you know, and incorporating that into my everyday life because, you know, it's a relationship. And I think, you know, yes, I do think it's very healthy to be active and, um, you know, constantly keeping yourself in a manner that is, you know, sustainable for your body, you know, when it comes to eating and all those things, because it's not even just so much about how you look, it's also about how you feel. And, Mm -hmm. you know, our bodies are a temple and God does want us to take care of them. And that doesn't mean that you have to look like a super fitness model, but that does mean that you have to prioritize your health, um, not only your spiritual health, but also your physical health as well. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With Fit for the King, the ministry that that does inspire conferences, we talk about availability, availability mm-hmm. to love God and serve other people, uh, not in an aesthetic goal, as you described. So you're you're we're on the same page there. Yeah. Uh, not not surprised about that. Um, mm-hmm. In the Fit for the King ministry and the Inspire conferences, we talk a lot about God's goal of holistic transformation which he is working in his church. And while your physical body might not need a makeover right now, uh, what areas of life do you sense God is currently working on with you? Hmm. God is currently working on my boldness and my patience. Um, I, I've seen it throughout this season of my life, just in arenas of, you know, in in my workplace, having to have conversations with people and, you know, truly take ownership of my career and and moving forward and taking those steps. And, you know, people have known me in the past and have known I've been kind of shy and timid and all those things, but just understanding that that's not who God calls me to be. You know, he calls me to be strong and, and bold and courageous and, you know, stepping into those, what can be uncomfortable situations, but you know, having the confidence and faith to go out and and do what I have to do is, it's definitely pushed my comfort zone for sure. Yeah. Um, and just my patience with not only, you know, other people, but truly with myself, you know, as a someone who's been so performance-based for so long, I can be very impatient with wanting results. Mm-hmm. Uh, so just, you know, really trusting God's timing with things and understanding that, uh, you know, certain things are truly a progression um, has been keeping me busy recently. So now some people might hear what you just said about boldness and just kind of automatically think anybody who's an Olympic gold medalist must really be bold and outgoing. But (laughs) why would we think that people are different emotional, you know, they're different personalities. Mm -hmm. There can be introverts who are really good at track. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so, uh, that, uh, that's neat to, to know that that is something that, that, uh, you, you have as part of your demeanor and Mm -hmm. uh, are that you're working on. Well, the Holy Spirit's work of transformation in our lives will often mean doing things that are uncomfortable, making unfamiliar changes and even taking risks. When I think of this truth, I'm reminding of how you made some an unusual change just nine months before the Tokyo Olympics that forced you to try new and uncomfortable things, but which led to remarkable transformation and even a new world record. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely. Yeah, I I would say that this change that I made, you know, right before an Olympic year, which is not common in the track world, you know, I think for any athlete making a change right before such a big year is always something that you have to really think about. But And this I was a, a coaching change. A coaching change, yeah, yeah, yeah. of all things. And yeah. Um, you know, I really felt that Bobby had the knowledge for what I wanted to do, um, and the experience for 
you know, he's, this is, this was his 12th Olympics that he has coached, you know, he's been around and he's coached the best of them, Jackie Joyner, Kersey and Flo jo and Allison and Gail Devers. And for me, I, I felt very strongly with just the person that he was and, you know, what we were going to be able to do together. And I had to truly have faith because I wasn't sure where it was going to go. Um, you know, not every coaching athlete dynamic works and clicks, but I, I just had faith throughout the whole season and it didn't start out well. I actually, my first race of the season, I came in dead last and I, you know, never came in last in my life, but it was truly just a, a humbling experience and, and, you know, time for me to look at God and just trust that everything would work out. And by the end of it, you know, we came out with a world record and it was just such an amazing testament to um, putting your faith in something higher than you, uh, because I knew that worrying and stressing about it was not going to help me get anything done, you know? Sure. So. Yeah. Very good. I brought uh, some uh, a special guest who uh, I'm giving an opportunity to ask a question, a female national high school, uh, I believe 800 meter uh, champion. Ainsley Erzin is with us and she has a question that she would like to ask you. Hi, thank Hi. you so much for having me on. You were such an inspiration to me, like just on the track and off the track with your faith and everything. And I think that goes for all athletes. Um, so I was just wondering, as we kind of talked about earlier, you made your mark like in the track world super early on in your life. And from what I've experienced, just from the smaller um, accomplishments I've had, um, having success is so cool and so rewarding, but it can also be just very stressful and overwhelming. It can come with like a lot of fears of disappointing others and things like is experiencing that. I can't even imagine what that's like um, at such a high level like you're at. So um, I was just wondering if there was ever a specific time that that kind of caused you to lose joy in the sport um, or even want to not do it anymore and what you learned about yourself and your faith during that time. Um, and if there's anything that struggle kind of taught you and um, anything that you implement into big races today um, when you start to get nervous or just into the way you live your life in general? That's a great question. It's also awesome to meet you. So thank you for being on. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um, man, yeah, there's definitely been times where those things have taken away from my joy of the sport, um, especially when you get to a level where you have so many people with opinions watching you. Um, it can be hard to kind of filter out the good from the bad, but I think in those moments, it's about keeping your eye on what matters. I love the support system and the group of people that I have around me because they always help keep me grounded and keep me focused on the things that truly matter, um, whether that's family and coaches, my fiance, whoever it is. Um, because, you know, there's always going to be people who have different opinions or who don't agree with you or don't like you. Um, but there's going to be a lot of people who do love you, you know, and it's it's what matters to you in those moments. Um, in times where I have been nervous or stressed before races, a lot of that nowadays, I think, praying, um, reading my Bible, listening to music and spending it with the people that I love, you know, my time. Um, my family comes to my races and they're there with me. My fiance is there, my trainer, my coach. And, you know, it's amazing to be able to share, share experiences like that with the people closest to you because they know you the best. And whether you win or you lose, having people who are in your corner who are going to support you are the biggest thing that matter, you know. Um, so for me, that's that's like kind of my world. You know, those are my people. That is what I love. And I know that God is watching over us. So there really is no fear because I know that at the end of the day, it's going to be the outcome that he wants as long as I give everything that I have. Mm -hmm. Ainsley, from what I know of your family, you have that support system uh, with, with your parents and, mm -hmm. and siblings. And so, uh, you've certainly got that as well as your faith. So I think that there's every hope that you're going to be able to weather those things in the bright future that's ahead for you at uh, Arkansas. I understand. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
Well, we'll, we'll launch you out there with uh, a lot of uh, good tidings. Well, thanks so much for sharing with us at Inspire Sydney. We really appreciate your time. But for a last question, I'll ask, what question didn't I ask that I should have? Oh my goodness. Um, I'm surprised you didn't ask if you want to race. I mean, we can race if you want. <laughs> <laughs> That I don't need to be humiliated more than I no, am on a daily kidding. basis. <laughs> Are you a runner at all? Uh, yeah, 5Ks. Uh, you know, oh. yeah, I was a pole vaulter and a wrestler. So okay. um, I did wrestling and pole vaulting at the high school level, and I did pretty well. But um, that wasn't something I was going to go to college and do. So I've been an avid watcher as well as just uh, staying fit and, yeah. uh, and that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm in the gym all the time. Uh, lifting weights and doing aerobic stuff. Uh, but yeah, yeah the, the competitive thing, uh, especially as you get older, uh, there's a lot of patching and, and owies that uh, tend to creep up. Uh, and uh, the days of just going out for a five or 10 mile run and not thinking twice about it are, are in my past. So, Well, you look good. So keep it up. Well, thank you. Can I quote well, you on that? Absolutely. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> So it's been great to have you, uh, Sydney, and we really appreciate your time. Thanks for your honesty and your candid answers. And uh, God's blessings on you as you try to merge the world of athletics with your, uh, your growth. And congratulations on your upcoming wedding. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.